Good evening. Thank you for coming out on a Friday evening as we begin this uh, series entitled Christ Our Righteousness, A Study of the Latter Rain and the Loud Cry in Adventist History. Let me start. Uh, thank you, Pastor, by the way, for the introduction. I thought I would share just a couple of pictures here. This is a picture of my family, my wife and three daughters, our three daughters, uh, in Dixie, Washington there. And a few years ago, uh, the Lord blessed us with an idea of uh, having a litter of puppies to raise and to sell as a means to um, fund our daughters going to different youth programs during the summer. And so, but we also wanted to make it a mission project as well. So all of the puppies are named after reformers. So there's Luther in there and uh, who else is in there? I'm trying to remember all the different names, but uh, someone asked me, well, what if, did you just have male puppies? Well, no, there was females as well. And so they got to be named the wives' names of some of the reformers. And so with every puppy that we sold or that the Lord led uh, people to buy, we also would give them the copy of The Great Controversy and tell them where they could read about that reformer for which their, that puppy was named after. So uh, like I said, we live in Dixie, Washington, up there in the foothills, which is out of the Walla Walla Valley, about 25 miles. And we have a nice area there to grow a garden and to enjoy nature on a, on a daily basis. And, and as our daughters were growing up, they uh, had the, the fun of, uh, I would say, almost living in a zoo there. So here you see a cat, an owl, a deer, and a dog, and they're all friends. So it was like a taste of, of heaven and some beautiful sunsets. And by the way, on the drive up today, wow, what a beautiful area up here in uh, Canada, and we're glad to be here tonight. Well, the great, the, the great controversy is the topic for tonight, and you know, I don't know if we all often realize how privileged we are as Seventh-day Adventists to have an understanding of the great controversy. There are millions of people in the world that don't understand why there's all of this sin and sadness and death and uh, the Lord has blessed us in the scriptures, but also in the uh, added writings of Ellen White to give us an idea of this controversy that we're involved in. And so tonight we're going to talk about that 6,000 years we're going to cover tonight, which obviously is just going to be a bird's eye view. But we want to particularly look at how the message of righteousness by faith is really at the core of that great controversy all the way down to our day. And so we shouldn't be surprised when in our day there the devil is always trying to counter Christ as he reaches out with the plan of salvation to touch every one of our lives. Then tomorrow morning we're going to talk about why Adventist history is important and we're going to show how God raised up this movement and then we're going to lead into that time in 1888 when God sent a most precious message to us as a people. And then tomorrow afternoon, we're going to start with the revivals. And so two meetings tomorrow afternoon, and then Sunday will end. And all three of those, we're going to talk about the revivals that God brought to us as a church. So what about this whole great controversy and the origin of sin that we find ourselves in this world of sin today. Notice what Ellen White says here in The Great Controversy, the book itself. She says, It is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Yet enough may be understood concerning both the origin and the final disposition of sin to make fully manifest the justice and benevolence of God in all his dealings with evil. So even amidst this great controversy of sin and sadness around us, we can still see the, the blessings and the loving character of God in his working through this great controversy. Sin is an intruder for whose presence no reason can be given. It is a myst it's mysterious, unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse for it be found or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. And by the way, I forgot to mention, but I'm going to be relying heavily on uh, PowerPoint slides. And 
one of the reasons is because I want you to read, not only tonight, but mainly as we start talking about Adventist history itself, I want you be, to be able to read those statements yourselves and see that all of this has been kept for us to read and to study today. And by the way, I'll add one other thing, and that is that I will make these, if you're taking notes, I will uh, leave a copy of these PowerPoints with the pastor, and then if you missed a, a reference or something, you can ask him and get a copy of, of that after the weekend. Well, how did this great controversy play out? Of course, it started in heaven with the rebellion of Satan, who was then cast down to this earth. And then, as we all know, that first pair, Adam and Eve, uh, fell under his temptation in that tree of knowledge and good and evil. And, but from the very beginning, God promised that there was still hope for mankind. And notice what is said here, heaven pitied man and the plan of salvation was devised. When the curse was pronounced upon the race in connection with the curse, there was given the promise of pardon through a savior who was to come. This promise was the star of hope that lighted up the gloom, that like the pall of death hung over the future of man and of the world which was given him as his dominion. The gospel, notice, was first preached to Adam and Eve in Eden. So from the very beginning in that Garden of Eden, after the fall, God presented the gospel for righteousness by faith. And he did that through type through showing a lamb slain. Notice again another statement. Though they must suffer from the power of their mighty foe, still through the merits of Christ, there they could look forward to victory. The mystery of the gospel was spoken in Eden when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So again, from the very beginning, we see that God stepped in and brought this promise of hope to mankind. And yet, that great controversy will be seen for everything that God did. Satan sought to misrepresent and to confuse minds so that the plan of salvation would not be clearly seen. And again, we see this from almost the very beginning in the children of Adam and Eve. When Cain and Abel uh, were to bring that sacrifice, uh, showing repentance and faith in that coming Redeemer, controversy came in. Notice this, between righteousness and sin, love and hatred, truth and falsehood, there is an irrepressible conflict. When one presents the love of Christ and the beauty of holiness, he is drawing away the subjects of Satan's kingdom, and the prince of evil is aroused to resist it. So it shouldn't surprise us when we see constant conflict on this earth, in families, in churches, in society around us. The character of the persecution changes with the times, but the principle, the spirit that underlies it, is the same that has slain the chosen of the Lord ever since the days of Abel. And so this great controversy, Christ is seeking to reach people through the plan of salvation, through teaching and, and, the, and before the cross, through types, the sacrificial system, and Satan was there to bring in confusion and to try to thwart all that God was doing. Another statement about Cain and Abel. Notice, Cain and Abel represent two classes of men that have existed from generation to generation and will continue to exist to the close of time. One availed himself of the promised sacrifice for sin. The other ventured to depend upon his own merits. His was the sacrifice of a sinner without the virtue of divine mediation which is alone able to bring him into favor with God. So from the very beginning, this idea of Cain was that somehow through his own merits, his way, he could save himself. And that as well 
we will see during this whole 6,000 year period. The class of worshipers who follow the example of Cain includes by far the greater portion of the world. For nearly every false religion has been based on the same principle. And notice this principle. That man can depend upon his own efforts for salvation. It is claimed by some that the human race is in need not of redemption, but of development that it can refine, elevate, and regenerate itself. And by the way, you can see this concept today in 2018. Even in religious circles. As Cain thought to secure the divine favor by an offering that lacked the blood of a sacrifice, so do these expect to exalt humanity to the divine standard, independent of the atonement. The history of Cain shows what must be the result. It shows what man will become apart from Christ. Humanity has no power to regenerate itself. It does not tend upward toward the divine, but downward toward the satanic. Christ is our only hope. And that was the, the truth 6,000 years ago, and it's the truth for us today. Well, in every generation, God then would raise up those who would preach on righteousness, the plan of salvation, and Satan would seek through his efforts to confuse and to thwart all of those plans that, that God had in saving mankind. Enoch is the next uh, example. Enoch also was a preacher of righteousness and sought to turn men from their evil ways. For 300 years he walked with God, giving the world the example of pure and spotless life, one which was in marked contrast with the lives of the men of that self-willed and perverse generation who openly disregarded God's holy law and boasted of their freedom from its restraint. So again, God raised up Enoch, who in that generation was a preacher of righteousness to proclaim the message of God. What about Noah? 120 years of probation was granted to the inhabitants of the world, and Noah was to live through that generation. Amid worldwide contempt of God, he was a faithful preacher of righteousness. And it wasn't just by what he said, it was by what he did, how he guided his family and lived that life of righteousness, exemplifying to the world what a man's life could be by reposing confidence in the sure word of God, by rendering obedience to all his commandments. God had came to him and said, build a way of escape. And Noah believed and followed God's will. But notice what happened um, even at the time of Noah in regard to the sacrificial system that God had instituted uh, in the Garden of Eden. Nearly the whole world was against Noah, yet there were many who had not had light in regard to the redemption that had been promised to our first parents. The significance of the sacrificial offerings had been perverted. So you notice now how Satan, even by the time of Noah, had perverted that uh, description of the plan of salvation through the sacrificial system in such a way that people had the wrong concept, some did, of God and the plan of salvation. Ellen White continues, and they no longer shadowed forth the sacrifices to the people, the method of the atonement. So see how Satan has continually works to try to bring in uh, perversion or confusion in regard to the plan of salvation. Well, we move down, skip over Abraham, which would be another great example, but what about his children, the children of Israel in the time of Egypt, when they left Egypt and went into, uh, headed to Canaan. And notice uh, what Ellen White says in this statement. 
If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham, there would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant of which circumcision was a sign, they would never have been seduced into idolatry, nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. They would have kept God's law in mind, and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved upon tables of stone. This is from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets. Amazing statement that God, because he had a, a plan A, was then led to his next plan, or plan B, uh, to uh, respond to the confusion that Satan brought in. The statement continues, And had the people practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need of the additional directions given to Moses. The sacrificial system committed to Adam was also perverted by his descendants. Again, we see that perversion of the gospel as shown in the sacrificial system. Superstition, idolatry, cruelty, and licentiousness corrupted the simple and significant service that God had appointed. Through long intercourse with idolaters, the people of Israel had mingled many heathen customs with their worship. Therefore, the Lord gave them at Sinai definite instructions concerning the sacrificial service. So at Sinai, a much more intricate and in-depth uh, system was set up to impress upon the people their total need in that Lamb of God, the Savior of this, uh, from the sins of the world. We come down to, of course, uh, when the Israel comes into Canaan, and then they decided after the judges, they wanted a king. And within a hundred years after the temple was built, Solomon's temple was built, again, great confusion, even in Israel itself, in regard to the meaning of the sacrificial system, the plan of salvation. Notice uh, what Ellen White says here in Patriarchs and Prophets. By perverted conceptions of divine attributes, heathen nations were led to believe human sacrifices necessary to secure the favor of their deities. So these were the nations around Israel. And the most horrible cruelties have been perpetuated under various forms of idolatry. Among these were the practice of causing their children to pass through the fire before their idols. In times of great apostasy, these abominations prevailed to some extent among the Israelites. So even among God's chosen people, they forgot the meaning and the, of the figure in the sacrificial system and began to integrate even some of these pagan uh, and heathen uh, sacrifices and traditions. Another statement in this regard. The position that it is of no consequence what men believes is one of Satan's most successful deceptions. He knows that the truth received in the love of it sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Therefore, he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories fables, another gospel. From the beginning, the servants of God have contended against false teachers, not merely as vicious men, but as inculcators of falsehoods that were fatal to the soul. Elijah, Jeremiah, Paul firmly and fearlessly opposed those who were turning men from the word of God. So again, we see this great controversy. God seeking to present the gospel in its fullness and Satan bringing in falsehood sometimes even among God's people. Well, what about when Christ came the first time to his own people? That nation that God had raised up 
to be an example to the world, to be a way in which God could take the message of salvation to the world. Notice this from Desire of Ages. Through heathenism, Satan had for ages turned men away from God, but he won his great triumph in perverting the faith of Israel. By contemplating and worshiping their own conception, the heathen had lost a knowledge of God and had become more and more corrupt. So it was with Israel. The principle, notice, the principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. It's the same today. It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle, and notice, wherever it is held, men have no barrier against sin. So here's a nation that is meticulous in its traditions in order to gain victory over sin. And yet they had no barrier against it because they were seeking it in their own merit. Ellen White continues, the message of salvation is communicated to men through human agencies. But the Jews had sought to make a monopoly of the truth, which is eternal life. They had hoarded the living manna, and it had turned to, to corruption. The religion which they tried to shut up to themselves became an offense. They robbed God of his glory, defrauded the world by a counterfeit of the gospel. They had refused to surrender themselves to God for the salvation of the world, and they became agents of Satan for its destruction. It's incredible. I've been reading through recently, again, The Desire of Ages, and if I'm honest, I recognize human nature there and in me still today. God help us. Well, one of the things that Jesus did when he was here at his first coming was to try to take all the rubbish away from that sacrificial system that he himself had given from in Eden and at Sinai. Notice, the people whom God had called to be the pillar and ground of the truth had become representatives of Satan. They were doing the work that he desired them to do, taking a course to misrepresent the character of God and cause the world to look upon God as a tyrant. The very priest who ministered in the temple had lost sight of the significance of the service they performed. So they went about the service, but they didn't understand what it meant. They had ceased to look beyond the symbol to the thing it signified. In presenting the sacrificial offerings, they were as actors in a play. In other words, they weren't engaged personally. The ordinances which God himself had appointed were made the means of blinding the mind and hardening the heart. God could do no more for man through these channels. The whole system must be swept away. And you'll see this when Christ came in the cleansing of the temple He he sought to bring his listeners back to the original meaning of the sacrificial system and who it pointed to. And in Luke chapter 5, verse 33, um, there's a section there where the um, Pharisees are asking him why, or asking his disciples why John's disciples fast and Jesus' disciples don't. So this statement is in that context. The principle presented by Christ, the manner of observing feasts, of praying to God, could not be properly united to the forms and ceremonies of the Pharisaism. And Christ went on to talk about that new wineskins. The old wine wouldn't, or the new wine wouldn't fit in the old wineskins. In this familiar illustration, 
new wine into old bottles, Jesus presented the impossibility of making those who were satisfied with legal religion the depositaries of the living truth of heaven. So unless the Pharisees and the Sadducees saw Christ as the fulfillment of that sacrificial system, their minds would not be open to the truths that he was seeking to teach them. Those who would not receive the light and the grace of Christ, who rejected the truth he came to bring them, were compared to old bottles, to worthless and worn out garments. Rejecting the truth themselves, they were ever seeking to sow the seed of doubt and questioning in the mind of the disciples in order that the truth unfolded to them by Christ should not make its impression on the heart and the spirit. And this is the saddest thing. Here's Christ coming to his own people, and even when he's seeking to teach his disciples, the religious leaders are there seeking to bring in doubt and questioning of what Jesus is seeking to teach them. They exalted, the Pharisees, ceremonies, human exactions, and the commandments of men as more essential than the teachings of Christ. The difference between the fresh, pure doctrines of heaven and the lifeless teaching of the Pharisees made manifest the fact that the vital truth of God could find no place for expansion in the old religious rites that were ready to vanish away. To the Pharisees, the teachings of Jesus was new in almost every respect. This is, this is fascinating to me. Was unrecognized and unacknowledged as truth. They professed to have respect for the religion of Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Moses. But although Christ taught the original truths that had been committed to the fathers, his teaching was new to the Pharisees because they had perverted and misrepresented and burdened down the requirements of God until the truth had lost its original significance and beauty. And you know, as we read through all of these things, through the great controversy, and we see how Satan is always seeking to bring in confusion, we should bring that understanding even down to our day and see if the same thing doesn't sometimes happen today in the world and sometimes even in our church. Well, what about the disciples? Were they free from that uh, misunderstanding? And as we know, you know, those first three and a half years when Jesus sought to teach them uh, so often, they were still uh, caught up in those old traditions. Notice, while they had been attracted by the love of Jesus, the disciples were not wholly free from Pharisaism. They still worked with the thought of meriting a reward in proportion to their labor. They cherished a spirit of self-exaltation and self-complacency and made comparisons among themselves. When one of them failed in any particular, the others indulged in feelings of superiority. Lest the disciples should lose sight of the principles of the gospel, Christ related to them the parable in Matthew 19, 20, uh, 19, 21. Well, what about the disciples after Pentecost, after the cross, when they had a fuller vision of that plan of salvation? As with holy boldness, Paul proclaimed the gospel in the synagogues at Thessalonica. A flood of light was thrown upon the true meaning of the rites and ceremonies connected with the tabernacle service. So not only after the cross and Pentecost did the disciples go out and proclaim the gospel, they could also point to the significance of the sacrificial system, which had pointed to the reality as was found in Jesus Christ. And by the way, I believe that's part of the message that God has given to us as Seventh-day Adventists as well. To not only point to Christ in his uh, fulfillment in coming the first time, but to show that that was a fulfillment of those sacrificial uh, rites of the Old Testament times. Continuing, he carried, Paul carried the minds of his hearers beyond the earthly service and the ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary to the time when having completed his meditorial work, Christ would come again in power and great glory 
and establish his kingdom on the earth. Well, then there was a great falling away. The disciples were either executed or exiled, and when they passed to their death, um, the man of sin would arise, and for 1260 years, there was what we call the Dark Ages on this planet. And notice what is said here. Uh, Ellen White says, The man of sin was to arise and to do his work of exaltation and blasphemy before the brethren could look for the coming of Christ. That great event was to be preceded by a falling away. There would be revealed a form of Antichrist, and the leaven of apostasy was to work with increasing power to the end of time. So again, even after the, cro the cross, when Christ was lifted up, and that message in one generation was taken to the world, there was still more of this controversy that would play out on this planet until Christ would return. And what about this power that arose in those dark ages? A prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and to shun it. But many are so wise in their own conceit that they feel no need of humbly seeking God that they may be led into the truth. Although priding themselves on their enlightenment, they are ignorant both of scripture and the power of God. And notice this. They must have some means of quieting their conscience and they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. What they desire is a method of forgetting God, which shall pass as a method of remembering him. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. Notice, it is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world. Those who would be saved by their merits and those who would be saved in their sins. Here is the secret of its, the papacy's power. And I believe this represents the two extremes. Seeking to be saved by merit or believing that you can just be saved in sin. And the papacy, Ellen White says here, great controversy, embraces those two concepts in which takes in almost the whole world. Again, this great controversy over the plan of salvation. Well, what would God do during these dark ages? He would raise up reformers to counteract the falsehood about God and the plan of salvation. Now, of course, Luther never started thinking he was going to start an, another church. He was a Roman Catholic himself, and he was seeking to bring reform to his own church. There was a present truth in the days of Luther, Ellen White says, a truth at that time of special importance, and there is a special present truth for the church today. But truth is no more desired by the majority today than it was by the papist who opposed Luther. So when Luther came, of course, started out with nailing those 95 theses on the door, and uh, the response, though, was obviously not what he hoped for in seeking to, like I said, counteract the falsehoods of indulgences and other traditions that were being taught by the church. But notice that after Luther died, many of the truths that he had taught also began to uh, be counteracted. Unfortunately, uh, no, no, this one is that Luther did not have the whole truth. It was the beginning of the Reformation. And this is what Norval P. says. Unfortunately, Luther followed Augustine rather than Paul in his teaching of predestination, freedom of will, and kindred doctrines. The middle of the 16th century found, therefore, two dominant Protestant schools of thought in Europe, Lutheranism and Calvinism. Both were serving to emancipate thousands from the bondage of medieval Catholicism, and both were defending valiantly certain scriptural doctrines. But both systems, however, possessed glaring weaknesses. So it's interesting that God, obviously, he uses us as fallible human beings, even when we don't understand fully 
his plan. And that was the case with Luther and other reformers. They had been raised up in a church during a very dark time, and yet God used them to present truth. But the point was is that the Reformation wasn't supposed to stop there. It was to keep going. Notice what Ellen White says. The Reformation did not, as many supposed, end with Luther. It is to be continued to the close of this world's history. Luther had a great work to do in reflecting to others the light which God had permitted to shine upon him, yet he did not receive all the light which was to be given to the world. From that time to this, new light has been continually shining upon the scriptures and new truths have been constantly unfolding. So we're going to see this a little bit more this evening and then also tomorrow, how God has sought to continue this reformation, to continue to bring truth out of the scriptures to each generation. Well, within a hundred years after Luther, notice what John Robinson says. Ellen White quotes him in The Great Controversy. He says, I cannot sufficiently bewail the condition of the Reformed churches who are come to a period in religion and will go no further than the instruments of their reformation. The Lutherans cannot be drawn to go any farther than what Luther saw, and the Calvinists, you see, stick fast where they were left, left by the great man of God, who yet saw not all things. So even back in his day, Robinson realized that the Reformation, unfortunately, sometimes stalled because the next generation was not willing to continue with that Reformation. This is how Ellen White puts it. The great doctrine of justification by faith, so clearly taught by Luther, had been almost wholly lost sight of, and the Romanist principle of trusting to good works for salvation had taken its place. Whitfield and the Wesleys, who were members of the established church, were sincere seekers for the favor of God, and this they had been taught was to be secured by a virtuous life and an observance of the ordinances of religion. So by the time you come from Luther down to the Wesley, 1700s, the Romish, Romanish idea had crept back even into Protestant churches, that somehow through man's own merits, they were to seek the favor of God. And this is how Wesley even talks about himself. He was born in 1703 and died in 1791. And uh, this is actually how Ellen White uh, talks about his life and his coming to see things differently, even in his own Christian experience, and what a change it brought in his own life and in his ministry. Through long years of wearisome and comfortless striving, years of rigorous self-denial and reproach and humiliation, Wesley had steadfastly adhered to his one purpose of seeking God. Now after his conversion, he found him. And he found that the grace which he had toiled to win by prayers and fasts, by alms deeds and self-abnegation, was a gift without money and without price. Once established in the faith of Christ, his whole soul burned with the desire to spread everywhere a knowledge of the glorious gospel of God's free grace. So when Wesley came to understand the message of righteousness by faith, it transformed him and his life and his ministry, and he had to go out and share. He continued his strict and self-denying life, not now as the ground, but the result of faith, not the root, but the fruit of holiness. The grace of God in Christ is the foundation of the Christian hope and that grace will be manifest in obedience. Wesley's life was devoted to the preaching of this, of the great truths which he had received, justification through faith in the atoning blood of Christ and the renewing power of the Holy Spirit upon the heart, bringing forth fruit in the life conformed to the example of Christ. So you notice that the message that uh, Wesley was proclaiming was not, just a, was not lopsided. It wasn't just a cheap grace uh, you know, Jesus did it all and I can go do what I want. It was that he found his sole hope in Jesus Christ and it transformed and changed him and he was obedient to Christ. 
Well, notice uh, what Ellen White says as she kind of summarizes this whole idea of the Reformation and how it's to continue to the end. The enemy of righteousness left nothing undone in his efforts to stop the work committed to the Lord's builders. Workers were raised up who ably defended the faith once delivered to the saints. Like the apostles, many of them fell at their post, but the building of the temple went steadily forward. The Waldensians, John Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, Martin Luther, Zwingli, Cranmer, Latmer, and Knox, the Huguenots, John and Charles Wesley, and a host of others brought to the foundation material that will endure throughout eternity. So even with the shortcomings of the reformers, they were laying the foundation, and we can praise the Lord for that, but they didn't finish the building. And in the latter years, those who have so nobly endeavored to promote the circulation of God's word and those who by their service in heathen lands have prepared the way for the proclamation of the last great message, these also have helped to rear the structure. Through the ages that have passed since the days of the apostles, the building of God's temple has never ceased. And that temple is still being built and finished today and someday that temple will be finished, so to speak, and Christ will come. Well, what about the Reformation came down to the great Advent movement in the 1830s and 40s? Notice what Ellen White says about those years, 1840 to 1844. She says, the Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world, and in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. So here during that great Advent movement, not just by William Miller, but many others who God laid the same message upon, unbeknownst to each other, that message went around the world, and Ellen White here compares it even to the Reformation of the 16th century. But, she says, these are to be far exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. And she's speaking of now our day. Notice another statement here. Um, the great, a great religious awakening under the proclamation of Christ's soon coming is foretold in the prophecy of the first angel's message of Revelation 14. The message is declared to be a part of the everlasting gospel, and it announces the opening of the judgment. The message of salvation has been preached in all ages, but but this message is a part of the gospel which could be proclaimed only in the last days. There is a part of that gospel message that could only be proclaimed after 1844 that temple continually to be built, that message continually to uh, rise and grow. For only then would it be true that the hour of judgment had come. So we as a people have been given not only the foundation from the Reformation, but more truth and light to share with the world. The prophecies present a succession of events leading down to the opening of the judgment, This is especially true of the book of Daniel. But that part of this prophecy which related to the last day, Daniel was bidden to close up and seal to the time of the end. Not till we reach this time could a message concerning the judgment be proclaimed based on the fulfillment of these prophecies. The coming of Christ could not take place before that time. In other words, there is a judgment hour message to be proclaimed that could not be proclaimed until 1844, after 1844, but must come before Christ returns. No such message has ever been given in past ages. Paul, as we have seen, did not preach it. He pointed his brethren to the then far distant future for the coming of the Lord. The reformers did not proclaim it. Martin Luther placed the judgment about 300 years in the future of his day, from his day. Well, this message of righteousness by faith is to be a part of our message as Seventh-day Adventists to be given to the world. 
And in 1888, I'm just going to briefly touch on this. Ellen White makes a comment, actually, several years later about that most precious message that God brought to us as a people. She says, The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Wagner, elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, and that's what we call the loud cry, and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure, and that's what we refer to as the latter rain, and the, the scriptures refer to that as the latter rain. Well, that message is more than just what the reformers taught. Notice what Ellen White says here. Great truths that have been lain unheeded and unseen since the day of Pentecost are to shine from God's word in their native purity. To those who truly love God, the Holy Spirit will reveal truths that have faded from the mind and will also reveal truths that are entirely new. And so we see this, again, to summarize. The Reformation, God raised up men to... Um, counteract the darkness that had come over the earth over those 1260 years but each reformer did his part and built that foundation and then God would raise up others and that came all the way even to the raising up of the advent movement in the 1840s well what would happen or what is happening today and how do we see this great controversy playing out in the world in the the church itself, Roman Catholic Church itself. In 1999, there was a document written up. You may be familiar with this. And a ceremony took place there on October 31st, 1999, which is when Luther uh, nailed, October 31, nailed those 95 theses on the door. But notice in 1999, a ceremony took place between Catholics and Lutherans um, there in Wittenberg, Germany. And what was some of what they were agreeing on at that point, 1999? Number 40 in that document, which is very interesting to read, notice, the understanding of the doctrine of justification set forth in this declaration shows that a consensus in the basic truth of the doctrine of justification exists between Lutherans and Catholics. Therefore, the Lutheran and the Catholic explications of justification are in their difference open to one another and do not destroy the consensus regarding the basic truth. So, which is to say that basically leaders from the Lutheran Church and Roman Catholic Church got together and say, we can now say that we agree on the doctrine of justification by faith. 1999. Uh, number 41 in that document says, thus the doctrinal condemnations of the 16th century, insofar as they relate to the doctrine of justification, appear in a new light. The teaching of the Lutheran churches presented in this declaration does not fall under the condemnation of the Council of Trent, which was Roman Catholicism's anathema on the Reformation, the condemnations in the Lutheran confessions do not apply to the teachings of Roman Catholic Church presented in this declaration. In other words, we put aside our differences and disagreements and we've agreed to agree. 1999. Well, 2006, Roman Catholics and Methodists got together and in their declaration they said this, we, the churches, joined together in the world, Methodist Council, welcome this agreement with great joy. We declare that the common understanding of justification as it is outlined in the joint declarations on the doctrine of justification corresponds to the Methodist doctrine. Do you think Luther and the Wesley brothers would be signing this document if they were alive? No. They would be rolling over in their graves as, as we 
sometimes say, if they knew this kind of thing was going on. How can Protestants and Catholics now come together and say they agree on justification by faith? Has Rome changed? Well, just last year, um, there was the 500-year anniversary and another document and celebration um, was, that took place to commemorate this. This was actually uh, taken from a statement in 2014 looking forward to this event that happened last fall. In 2017, Lutherans and Catholic Christians commemorate together the 500th anniversary of Roman Reformation. On this occasion, Lutherans and Catholics will, for the first time, have opportunity to keep one and the same global ecumenical commemoration, not in the form of a triumphalist celebration, but rather to confess our common faith in the triune God. So now, again, this is another step saying we are in full agreement together. But has there really been a change? Is Rome teaching the truth about the plan of salvation? The gospel, is this the gospel? They use all the terms, justification by faith, sanctification, the gospel, the plan of salvation, but do they mean the same thing? Catechism, this is 2010, this is what it says um, under the number 2010 in the book. Since the initiative belongs to God in order of grace, no one can merit the initial grace of forgiveness and justification at the beginning of conversion. So they would state that much. Moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity, we can then merit for ourselves and for others the graces, graces needed for our sanctification, for the increase of grace and charity, and for the attainment of eternal life. So they can actually merit in part of the plan of salvation, even eternal life. Even temporal goods like health and friendship can be merited in accordance with God's wisdom these graces and goods are the object of Christian prayer. So the question is, has Rome changed? No. So who has changed? Protestant churches. Under number 1459, this is what uh, the catechism says. Absol absolution takes away sin, but it does not remedy all the disorders sin has caused. Raised up from sin, the sinner must still receive his full spiritual health by doing something more to make amends for sin. He must make satisfaction for or expiate his sins. This satisfaction is also called penance. So again, the very thing that Luther spoke out against 500 years before is still being taught, and yet these declarations have been made. So is the great controversy still going on today? I would say it's reaching its pinnacle in the very times that we're living. Well, I would say then that today, God is still wanting the true message of righteousness by faith to be proclaimed in this world. And he has given that to us as a people to unite with him in doing so. Notice what Ellen White says in this statement. Let the subject be made distinct and plain that it is not possible to affect how much? Anything in our standing before God or in the gift of God to us through creature merit. Should faith and works purchase the gift of salvation for anyone, then the creator is under obligation to the creature. Here is an opportunity for falsehood to be accepted as truth. And there are millions of people in this world that are accepting a falsehood instead of truth because they don't know. If any man can merit salvation by anything he may do, then he is in the same position as who? the Catholic, to do penance for his sins. Salvation then is partly of debt that may be earned as wages. 
If man cannot by any of his good works merit salvation, then it must be holy of grace, received by man as a sinner because he receives and believes in Jesus, period, right? It is wholly a free gift. Justification by faith is placed beyond controversy, and all this controversy is ended as soon as the matter is settled that the merits of fallen man in his good works can never procure eternal life for him. That message is still relevant today in 2018 and is to be proclaimed to the world and to a fallen Babylon who is still teaching the wine, the false doctrines that the reformers, God raised up reformers to refute. One more statement here, Ellen White, on this topic. In his divine arrangement, through his unmerited favor, the Lord has ordained that good works shall be rewarded. We are accepted through Christ's merit alone. And the acts of mercy, the deeds of charity, which we perform, are the fruits of faith. And they become a blessing to us, for men are to be rewarded according to their works. I, it, the plan of salvation is so amazing. It's all of God, and yet he blesses us and rewards us for that which he enables us to do. It is the fragrance of the merit of Christ that makes our good works acceptable to God, and it is grace that enables us to do the works for which he rewards us. Our works in and of themselves have no merit. When we have done all that is possible for us to do, we are to count ourselves as unprofitable servants. We deserve no thanks from God. We have only done what it was our duty to do, and our works could not have been performed in the strength of our own sinful natures. You know how often we're tempted to pat ourselves on the back when something actually good comes out of our life when it's all God doing it. Well, what is our message as a people if we were to summarize that? Of all professing Christians, Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Christ before the world. Now, notice really carefully here. The proclamation of the third angel's message calls for the presentation of the Sabbath truth. And there is going to be a final showdown between Sabbath and Sunday. That's true. But there's more to it than just those two days. There's underlying truths behind all of that. This truth, with others included in the message, is to be proclaimed. But the great center of attraction, Christ Jesus, must not be left out. That's where people are to be pointed to. You have billions of Roman Catholics who are looking to themselves for merit. You have billions of Muslims and Buddhists who are looking to self for merit. Every false religion, including Christian religions are based on that or have elements of that. It is at the cross of Christ that mercy and truth met together and righteousness and peace kissed each other. The sinner must be led to look to Calvary with the simple faith of a little child. He must trust in the merits of the Savior, accepting his righteousness, believing in his mercy. So for 6,000 years, from the very Garden of Eden, God has been seeking to point mankind to the Savior. And Satan has been seeking to point mankind to himself or herself. And we're reaching a time in this world's history where this message of pointing people to Christ and his righteousness is needed more than any other time. Tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about why history is important 
And as an introduction, I want to read a couple of slides here. This is another interesting statement that was made last year by Pope Francis. Notice, this is not to undertake an impractical correction of all that happened 500 years ago. He's speaking of the Reformation time. But rather to tell that history differently, free of any lingering trace of the resentment over past injuries that has distorted our view of one another. In other words, in order to come together with Protestants, let's rewrite the past so that we can just forget it, or at least the parts we don't want to remember, and then we can move forward together. And yet Rome has unchanged in its teaching, but they're rewriting the past in order to pull people in to this movement. But you know, Satan is seeking to rewrite even our own history. This article, May 17, 2018, is suggesting that the book, The Great Controversy, needs to be rewritten because it doesn't fit anymore, any longer, in the mindset of today. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. And that's why this seminar this weekend. Tonight, we just, I tried to just introduce bird's eye view, 6,000 years. The devil has brought a controversy against Christ in the plan of salvation. And every generation, God is seeking to raise up a people to present his truth to the dying world. And in a culmination, he's going to do that in this generation. May we be a part of that. Would you stand with us, stand with me as we pray? Father, we thank you for your loving patience and mercy towards us for 6,000 years on this planet. And Father, we pray tonight that we would have a greater glimpse of this great controversy that we would also see, Lord, that for everything that you seek to do good, Satan is there seeking to bring evil. And Lord, we're asking that you will give us clear discernment, that you will show us how you want to raise up this church in uh, Surrey here and the churches all over this world to, to raise up a, a people that will present the truth about Christ and his righteousness. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to bless as we study these things over the weekend. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.